So we just want to take this time to thank you, tell you how much we love you, and we've involved the little kiddos. So kiddos, come on up, find your pastor. Come on up. <laughs> so let's all give our pastor some love. so much as they work out whatever they're working out there. I'm going to share just for a few minutes. Um, as you guys know, we're gone. We're so glad to be back. Thank you guys for being so faithful and everyone, all the work that you guys did while we were gone. Three weeks is a long time. Um, but we took two weeks off for vacation. We had a great time. So thank you guys for being faithful and being here and all that good stuff. But I want to share something with you that... Um, of course, you know, you're gone, you have, you know, different place, different pace, different perspective. So it's always good to get out of your environment because it changes the way that you see things or the way you think about things. So I want to leave you guys with this encouragement that a season seasons you. And so many times there is a reason to the season that you're in and that it's adding flavor to your next. But the biggest thing that I got out of it was don't try to get out of this season. So many times we try to rush through a season, not realizing that God is trying to season us in this season for the next. And the season is not for you to be tasty for you. It's for other people to be able to taste you and see Jesus, right? Amen. The Bible tells us what? To give thanks in everything. Not for everything, in everything. What does that do? It changes your perspective of God is great and greatly to be praised no matter what happens. But also, it, it, it was this lesson of even when we go through pain and difficulty, even in pain, you can still God, give God praise. Amen. Amen. Not for the pain, but in the pain because he's still worthy. And when you change your perspective to see God, we're getting ready to go to a season of thankfulness. Learn to be thankful for everything. Your pain, be thankful. You're hurting, 
be thankful. You're joyful, be thankful. If it's difficult at work, be thankful. So learn in this season to be thankful for anything that you are going through, knowing that God is adding value and seasoning to you for your next season so that when other people taste you, you won't be too salty and you won't be saltless. Too many Christians are too salty. They're trying to rush the season. And you can't eat anything that's too salty. And you cannot eat anything that's really bland. So God is trying to flavor us right. And he knows that in everything that we're going through, I don't care what struggle, what difficulty, it has been there to season you for someone else. So that when you see someone else hurting, you can what? Have compassion on them. Why? Because you've been hurting before. If you go through grief, you can have compassion on them because you grieved before. If you're going through anything, you can... Bear witness and understand what they're going for. So I'm leaving you with that. That this season is trying to season you. Don't get out of too quickly what God is trying to perfect and do in you. Amen. Thank you. Well, I'll just echo what she said. It's good to see everyone uh, or be back. Home is always good to be home. And I was talking to the guys in the back. Uh, right down to about 8 p.m., uh, where we were a few weeks, a few days ago. So uh, we've been getting up at one o'clock in the morning and looking around and stuff. You know, it's like, oh man, you know, it's, it's just it's just weird coming back and having to take the things in order. But um, it's good to be back. I want to thank Pastor Blaine, Joe, for yeah. doing a great job as I'm gone and being able to leave the house of God in, in good hands and, and all the leadership. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. A couple things I want to share before I get into. Um, today's chapter, we're going to start, our chapter is going to be at one page 114, cleanse ourselves, but a uh, couple things. When I walked in here on, was it Friday night at the Hall Festival? Thursday. Thursday night. I see, again, my days are going all over the place. And I walked in the back door, and I looked at what was going on here, and I was in awe. And I'm like, whose church is this? And I saw all the creativity. I saw all the games. I saw what what um, Pam had done. I saw all of the people, all of our kids here, all of the guests here. I was so honored. And all, I mean, it was outstanding. And it was such a wonderful, not so much of an alternative to what the world does, but it's just a, a little sprinkling of, of, of what we can do. We're gonna do more next year. but. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys make me so proud. I mean, all the volunteers that came out, all of you parents who brought your kids out, thank you. I hope they had fun. I hope they got all the candy they want. I hope they went back and stayed up till 12 o'clock in the morning. So praise God for that. So it was it was absolutely incredible. So thanks. And this, the next thing is I want to echo what Shauna said earlier. Um, and as she said it, the Lord spoke to me, and, and I shared this on Facebook earlier this week. You know, um, we went and voted uh, yesterday. And it doesn't matter who we voted for, but it matters that we voted. And that's why I want to pass on everybody, too, because people died to give you the right to vote. Right. And I'll never, ever share my political opinion on, on, on in the pulpit. Uh, but by the same token, too, um, I feel like God is giving us a second chance as Christians. Because we really screwed it up in 2020. We really did. We said some stupid stuff on Facebook, some stupid stuff on Instagram. And you, and, and you alienated yourselves from people who aren't saved, people who are saved. Uh, we literally had a house cleaning during 2020 in this church. Yeah. And I had to really reference, not lovingly say, listen, uh, you cannot say that and go to my church, I'm sorry. Just, just, just can't do that. And so I wanna challenge you all, God is giving us a reading here on Tuesday. Is it Tuesday? Yeah, yeah. Tuesday. And keep your opinion to yourself. <laughs> Unless you're talking to your family, and sometimes that's splitting families. It's not y'all. It, it is not, you know what, and, and I'll be frank, even though I'm Jerry. You know, my brother and I don't agree on the same thing as for politics. Do I bring it up? No. Why? Because it's a touchy issue. I'd rather hang out with him and, you know, travel and do goofy stuff and watch the Three Stooges and, and, and Tonto together. You, you know what I mean? That's, I'd rather talk to him about what I love about him than what we have, don't have in common. And so make it a point, y'all. You don't, you know what? Everyone's got an opinion, and just like armpits, and most of them stink. And it's okay to not agree. But when you, when, whomever wins on Tuesday, when we die as Christians, we will not go to Washington, D.C. 
Okay, we will go to heaven or hopefully heaven. And and the, the whole point when we say that is that we make it such a big deal about who's in office. Y'all, the Israelites prospered while Pharaoh was in office. Paul prospered while while, while uh, Caesar was, up, was in office. So it doesn't matter who's in office. It, it matters who's on the throne. Amen? And that's so important. And let's just drop the bravado of what you believe in. Great, awesome. You know what? Let's keep let, let's keep Jesus at the full. Okay? Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Well, and I've been gone, and, and, and the Lord has given me two jokes. While I was gone. <laughs> and so, um, just two, huh? Yes, just one of them. No, no, I got a whole, he had a whole bunch of them. Bunch of them. <laughs> you know, and He's so. Yes, narrow down to two. So here we go. Um, I had to go to the hospital because I had a peekaboo accident. I had a peekaboo accident. They put me in ICU. <laughs> My son's not laughing at all. Okay. So, this uh, this lumberjack, this this lumber. Well, okay, Dustin's laughing. Thank you, Dustin, for laughing. I appreciate that. Uh, this lumberjack went into a, a forest to uh to chop down a tree, and uh, he went to to swing his axe, and the tree said, "Stop! Don't hurt me. I'm I'm a talking tree." And the lumberjack goes, "Well, that's good because you'll die long." <laughs> You'll die a log. <laughs> Come on, Randy, help me out, your sister. <laughs> Allison, you better, thank you for laughing. And Adam, who's your sister? Get her right now. <laughs> All right, well, so I feel better now. It's good to be at home. Let's open our, our page 114. Here we go. Let's rock and roll. Hallelujah. It's good to be here, y'all. This is out of tongue. So. All right. Cleanse ourselves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Father God, that we can walk before you, not in our own honor, but in Jesus' blood, covered in his blood, Father. We thank you, Lord, that we can walk by faith, not by sight, and that we seek you with our heart, mind, and soul, and our desire, our passion, God, is to become more like you, Father. We thank you. We praise your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Page 114. Here we go. If you don't delight in the fact that your father is holy, 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 then you are spiritually dead. You may be in a church, you may go to a Christian school, but if there is no delight in your soul for the holiness of God, you don't know God. You don't love God. You're out of touch with God. You're asleep to his character. R.C. Sproul. <sighs> Cleanse ourselves. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring, Forever, Psalm 19.9. The psalmist gives two remarkable fruits of, the, of holy fear that should not be overlooked or taken lightly. Cleanliness and longevity. Let's examine the first and we'll further address the latter in a future chapter. Paul writes, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Here we see the same truth the psalmist communicates, yet in more depth. I first want to point out that holiness is brought to maturity through the fear of the Lord. That's important. Not the love of God, and we'll discover that later on. But holiness is brought to maturity. So if you're, and, and as I grew up, holiness was always kind of a negative thing because it meant that you were weird. And that you didn't wear makeup as a woman, and that you had to go to church eight times a week, and that church would be eight hours long on Sundays. That's not holiness. Holiness is simply being set apart for a special purpose that God does. And so it says, holiness is brought to maturity through the fear of God, not the love of God. So let's get down to the last uh, sentence there. It says, as we've already discussed, holiness is not the most popular subject these days. For many... Well, these days, for many, it carries a bad taste because it's no fun and puts a damper on life. It's viewed as either legalistic bondage 
or a virtue that's noble but unattainable. C.S. Lewis addressed this ignorance by writing, how little people know who think that holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, it is irresistible. So prepare yourself for the irresistible as we dive in. As I mentioned before, the primary definition of holiness is separation unto God. And this certainly includes purity. Consider a bride. She sets herself apart for her husband, which includes refusing to desire or engage with other lovers. This represents the purity aspect of holiness. Even so, Paul tells us to cleanse ourselves. He doesn't say the blood of Jesus will cleanse us. However, let me make this point clear. This is important, gang. Listen to this. The blood of Jesus does, not, does indeed cleanse us from all sin. However, we get confused when we mix the work of justification with the work of sanctification. And I'll discuss that better and gooder in a second. But let's keep going. When we repent and receive Jesus Christ as Lord, our sins were forgiven and we were washed completely clean. All right? So when you got saved... And, you're, and you have what's called true repentance, you were actually sorry for your lifestyle, and you said, Jesus, come into my life, I repent of my sins. At that point, spiritually, you are now clean. He has forgotten, he and God have forgotten everything you've ever done. Now, granted, there are consequences for what you've done, but that sin won't be held against you anymore. <clears throat> he doesn't remember this work. Uh, he, does, he doesn't remember them. This work is complete perfect and cannot be improved upon. We did nothing to merit this amazing reality. It was a gift from God. This is the work of justification. But the very moment we received justification, the work of sanctification, which is holiness, began. This is when what was done on the inside of us is worked out. Our new nature becomes an outward reality in the way we live, that is so important. Our new nature becomes an outward reality or an outward reflection of the way we live. This is precisely what Paul addresses when he writes, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in who? In you. In who? You. In you, both to will and to do for his good measure. So when you become a Christian, it's called justification. Okay? And, and, and this is so important because what happens sometimes, y'all, <clears throat> and this is why I don't like, and this is just me, this, this is my personal bent. This, this is why I don't like baptizing kids. And, and I don't like it when children come up and want to get saved at eight or five or six because they have no idea what's ahead of them. And that's going to be tested because you hear people, uh, I, mean, I grew up going to these funerals and, you know, these, these people are, you know, 400 years old and they're dead and stuff. And they'll say, well, they got saved at a young age, <laughs> but they died in a topless bar. <laughs> well, uh, that don't go together, bro. Sorry. Nope. It doesn't go together at all. You, you know, they died in a drunken stupor that doesn't go together. All right? And so what's important to make sure that what you say up here or what you say by your bedside or what you say when you want to become a Christian is reality that you live out until you die. Will you make mistakes? Oh, my gosh, yes. But you always run back to Jesus. You run back to Jesus. You run back and repent quickly. Quickly. All right? So now with that in mind, watch this here for a second. And let me say it real quick. If what I just said offended anyone, I don't want to offend anybody, but that's the reality that we live in. And that's why we have children who are in, 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 in kids' church and people who, can, who are a little older can handle them because that's what we deal with on a regular basis in the world. I deal with men who do it all the time. I deal with women who have that issue too. So I'd rather hear it here that's understood and, and, and lovingly said than have to face it out in the world. And I'll give an example real quick, because this is, this is why... <laughs> my personal opinion on Christmas is my personal opinion. I had a parent get mad at me one day and come to me at the church and say, listen, because I said Santa Claus is not real. 
And I sit on the pulpit. And he said, well, that's my responsibility to tell my kids. I said, they don't know yet? <laughs> I mean, they don't know that Santa Claus is fake? I mean, think about that. And so I'd rather you hear that here about, about the lifestyle of, of, of life of the world than I know because, you know, people, you know, there's a good friend, there's a guy I know, and, and they have a Santa Claus picture taken deal at his church. I'm like, really? At church? I'm going off the subject. All right, here we go. Let's keep going here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Where am I, honey? I don't know. <laughs> What, what clearly, what 116. 116. Clearly, it's still. Oh, here we go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> clearly, it is still a work of God's grace, but we must cooperate with the power He gives both to will and to do, just as fear and trembling positioned the people of Brazil to enter God's presence and receive from Him. So, holy fear and trembling ignite the position, ignite and position us to be empowered by His grace for obedience. A common mistake of many teachers in the Western church is declaring the work of holiness to be the same as the work of justification. All right? In other words, we don't need to do anything, which is not true. Jesus did it all, which is true. He did it all. So the argument is, even though we continue to live no differently from the world, controlled by our various lusts, we are holy because Jesus is our holiness. What makes this even trickier is there are indeed scriptures that seem to support their claims in the New Testament. However, the error stems from confusing our positional holiness with our behavioral holiness. Allow me to explain. Positional holiness is solely due to what Jesus did for us and speaks of our position in Christ. It's one of the blessings of Christ's work for justification even before he made the world. God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Ephesians 1, 4. We never could have made, I'm sorry, we never could have earned this position. Again, Paul writes, Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy and he freed us from sin. So now let's go to the screen real quick. I put up there justification and sanctification. Now, this is very important, church. When you get saved, you are now justified. You are now justified by faith. And my, my, my old pastor back home had a, had a saying, says, God sees you just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. Just as if I'd never. So you're now justified. You're wiped clean from all your sins. But sanctification comes with what you got to do now. The song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Okay, great, awesome. But now since he's paid it all, there's payback. You have to now live the life, Paul says, worthy of the calling. So I wrote this here, it's not up there. Justification is what Jesus did on the cross to get you saved. And sanctification is the process that you do as you become more like Christ because you're now saved. I'll say it again. Justification is what Jesus did on the cross to get you saved. Okay, he was flawless. He is flawless. He is perfect the Lamb of God, and sanctification, being sanctified, being set apart, is the process that you do as you become more like Christ Jesus because you're saved. When we were on the cruise, hallelujah, and I'm not, okay, and understand church, I'm just giving you an example. I'm not spiritually flexing, okay, because I'm sure there are people there who, who love Jesus too. But for some reason, we, we met this couple, sweet, sweet couple, and all they could do was talk about us. Because we were just, well, she's different, I'm weird. And so, <laughs> um, and you know, we just did stuff different, you know, we had fun, we talked, yada, yada, yada. And, but for the whole seven days, they always would kind of find us, so to speak. And they're from England. And, uh, you know, we talked about kids. And, you know, they have a 20-year-old son and 22-year-old son. And, you know. But what was the coolest thing is that I was sitting next to her. And I didn't know this. I was sitting next to the wife and the husband's, the husband's sister and her daughter. 
we were in the test kitchen eating pureed mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and so they were talking to me back and forth, and so the female friend that we met at dinner, my wife and I, her name is Netta, N-E-T-T-A. Well, she started talking to her sister-in-law, not seeing me. And then I turned around and I said, hey, and she goes, oh my gosh, we're just talking about you. And the point was this, what she said about us made her sister-in-law and niece want to know us. But it's not us they want to know. It's who's in us. Even though she had had five sangrias. <laughs> I mean, so, oh, man, hi. Hi, Jerry. So good to see you. We were just talking about you. I mean, she was drunk as a drunk. Oh, my God. You don't know, get that drunk. I mean, not y'all, them. Sorry, them. I mean, wow. Hallelujah. Five. It's just a little bitty thing. I mean, five. Five. Wow. Hallelujah. So, um, let's keep going here. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Let's turn the page. Page 118. Here we go. Let's rock and roll. At the bottom, or almost the bottom, says, recently, now y'all, and, and pastors hear the craziest things. And what you're going to hear right here is just an example of what we've heard over 15 years. All right. Recently after Sunday morning service, a man said to me, I am a single Christian. I sleep with women because it's impossible to live a celibate life. We've heard this before, by the way. I stopped for a few months, but then returned to sleeping with women. But that isn't the main issue of what I'm here to talk to you about. <laughs> my main question is, why am I having so many struggles in my business? Because you're a hoe. That's why. That's why. That's why. That's why. I mean, that is why. That is why. I mean, let's keep it straight. Let's keep it because you're a hoe. So, I mean, that's, you, you can't expect the love of God in your life. I mean, you can't. You just can't. Here's another one. And so he says, um, but and it says, he goes, I was shocked. Have our unbalanced messages of grace brought people to the place of believing they will abide in God's presence and blessings while they live in flagrant sin? Here's another one. In a Q&A at a church women's conference, a lady asked my wife, I really love my husband, but he travels a lot, and I keep sleeping with other men. What should I do? Should I tell him? Y'all, we've, we've heard this. We've heard this. We've heard this from, from, from people who are, who are not here in the church anymore. But the friends are not impressed with me. It's, it's like, you want to do what? Really? Okay. Uh, and what's funny, that's not, that's not funny, but what's into that, they never ask, they never say, Pastor, should I do this? They, after they've done it, they tell, well, this is what I did. <laughs> well, I mean, dude, come on. So the point of him saying this is this. And so let's just drop all the way down here where it says, whoever rejects this teaching is not rejecting a human being, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 8. Keep in mind, there is an irresistible part of holiness, and we will see this clearly as we continue in our pursuit of it. All right. Now, everyone right now, ready? Say, Pastor Jerry. Pastor Jerry. No matter what you say, no matter what you say in, the next three minutes, in the next three minutes, I love you. I love you. Okay. All righty. So here we go. Whew. Let's have a hard conversation as Christians. And I want y'all to, to pin this, to share this, because, because we have been lost for a while as Christians. And we have used grace as a toy instead of a tool. Amen. Okay? Is that up there now, guys? Grace, we've used grace as a toy instead of a tool. What do I mean by that? We've heard our whole life as Christians, and maybe you haven't, that if you sin, there's grace. If you sin, there's grace. The Bible says the word sin abound, grace abounds more. Awesome. But grace is the empowerment to not sin. It's not just a parachute. All right? And so as Christians... We can't just say, hey, I'm going to go and cuss somebody out today, or I'm going to not walk in love, or, or I'm going to be a glutton, and God will forgive me. 
That's called premeditated sin. You thought about it. You knew the you knew the consequence, and you knew the way out, and you did it because you wanted to do it. So, with that in mind, I'm going to share this here with you, and these are called the categories of mankind towards God. And this is really going to help us identify where people are predicated on their what? On their outward actions. Because only God can judge their inward actions, and he can only see it. But we see the fruit. Y'all, it was, it was, y'all, I love oranges, all right? I, 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 I love them, and, 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 I, and, and, and peaches, and I love fruit, period. It's just that thing that's long and yellow. But when we were in Valencia, have you heard of the Valencia orange? Yes. That's where they're from. And they're not orange, they're like a, they have a color of a, of almost a reddish, reddish orange. And we saw all these trees, trees in the, orange trees in Valencia are like cactus in Nevada. They're everywhere. So when the fruit falls, no one cares. They're everywhere. And I'm going to run around and just put them in my pants and put them, because they were so good. I mean, you taste them and it's just like, it's, it's amazing. And so many Christians are walking around and we have all this fruit on the ground. And so I'm going to walk you through this now because we're praying the wrong prayer for the wrong people sometimes. Okay? And this is going to help y'all understand this. Here we go. The categories of, man, of mankind towards God. You have the unsaved. Okay? They don't know God and they're held back in the discussion. That means they've never asked Christ to be their Lord and Savior. They have never repented of their sins. They may have said they're sorry. I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry. But they've never repented, meaning you do a 180 and you go the other way. You run from it. Hence, the Bible says that they are going to hell when they die. Okay. Here's the next category. People who are Christians and who are saved. Okay. Well, what's the definition of that, Jerry? Well, this is a person who has a passion for the things of God. They run from sin. They run from sin. They don't go, oh, there's sin. I'm going to just take my time. Take my time. No, they run like Hussein Bolt, like Carlos. They run. They run like a scary three-year-old girl. They run away because they know where that sin will take them. They run from sin. They seek the heart of presence and approval of the Lord on a regular basis. Meaning that he's a part of your daily conversation. Lord, should I say to this person? Lord, should I eat this? Lord, should I watch this on TV? Lord, should I put this in my ears? It's a regular dialogue. And because their thoughts and actions are God influenced, there is fruit and proof of God's presence working in their lives. Here we go. They know God. They love God. They fear God. They know God because they spend time with him. They love God because of what God did for them and Jesus did for them. And they fear God. And I'll say it again. The thing that kept me alive when I was younger is that I was scared to death of my parents. I knew they loved me, but I was scared. Scared. Okay, and, be, and fear, fear isn't a bad thing if it's rightly placed. Uh, you know, I told you story about, the, about us being out there shooting, and my son saw a rattlesnake. I didn't go pet it. Oh, I'm, I'm spiritual. From that decade, I'm going to you I would have worked out. You know, I'm, no. Man, God said so. It's something different, but I mean, thank God he didn't say so. <laughs> All right. Already? Okay. Here's the last one, y'all. Y'all love me? Yes. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Christian slash backslidden. That's a category. And that's what I mean by people who said, well, they were saved at a young age. Or, or maybe you were deceived when they told you to come up. You know, they said, well, Jesus will make it all good for you. No, he won't. Because what he's already done is what you're going to do right now is die. Okay? <laughs> So here we go. Ready? What does that mean? And think about the people in your life. Maybe think about yourself. 
when I see this. Here we go. Someone who continues to live a carnal lifestyle, who consistently dabbles in sin and rejects the truth of God. Well, it's my truth. Who cares? Who cares about your truth? Who cares? Just you and the people that you're sleeping with. Just you. You care about that truth. God don't care about that kind of truth. He wants the truth. Because you know why? Because you ain't free. You're bound. Watch this. This person thinks that they are secure and whack with God, but their lifestyle has no consistent evidence of his influence or presence. They will know we're a Christian by our what? And that means love when someone hits you in the face. That means love when someone talks about your grandkids. That, that means love when someone fires you unduly right and you still walk in love. They know God. They love God. But they don't fear God. Because if they feared God, they wouldn't be like that. So, unless there is true repentance, these careless, deceived, and lawless backsliders have the same potential eternal destination as the unsaved. That's scary. <sighs> Is my collar straight? Isn't it quiet? I mean, think about that for a second. Unless there is true repentance, not 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 Carl, not not. Okay, I'm sorry for cursing them out, God. Okay, okay, God, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry, God. I'm, okay, no, that's not true repentance. It's when you are on your face. It's when you're crying and, and when you know that you've offended God. You've offended the person that gave his son for you to die on the cross before you even born. That's true repentance. And when you, and then when, and here's the deal. When you leave the situation, when you, it, so in other words, it, if you're shacking and God reveals you that you're in sin, you move out the next day. Can I get any more, any more frank than that? Even though my, my name's Jerry. So if you're living with somebody and you you know, and I'm not talking about anybody because I've, I've been there, y'all. There's seasons in my life where I was in church, this is before I got married, went to her. In church, but acting foolishly. My, my tail was touching hell. Okay? And I was not living right. And I was in danger of hell. But thank God for his grace. Thank God for Pastor Dan Boone who said, Jerry, what are you doing? Thank God for my mother said, Jerry, this is why you made prosperous, son. You ain't you're living like hell. And I listened to those two people. And you know what? My mother, who knew my mother? My mother did not care about your feelings. <laughs> she was a 74 year old black woman, did not care about your feelings. Jerry, you are going to hell. You don't change your lifestyle. Oh, you hurt my feelings. She didn't care about that. Pastor Dan Boone, he's an old country guy. He didn't care. So, church. Unless there is true repentance, these careless, deceived, and lawless backfathers have the same potential eternal destination as the unsaved. So when we're praying for our family members, our bosses, how do we pray for them? Well, here we go. Now, this is on the screen. This came to me this morning at 2.15 a.m. Thank you, God, for that, for waking me up at 2.15 in the morning. <laughs> here we go. The un so if you're praying for someone, so say you're praying for someone who's never heard the gospel, ever. Okay, here's, here's, here's the verse you pray. Ephesians 1.16. Do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Why? The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Who has people in your life who say they're Christian but they ain't acting like it? 
Okay, here we go. Ready? First Corinthians 5.1. I'm going to read the uh, Passion Version. This is Paul writing a letter, letter to people who are in church. Keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. And the issue is this. Watch this. It is widely reported that there is gross sexual immorality among you. The kind of more immorality that's so revolting, it's not even tolerated amongst social norms of unbelievers. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Christian called Jamie, boy! Here you go. Are, are you proud of the fact that one of your men is having sex with his stepmother? Shouldn't this heartbreaking scandal bring you to your knees in, in tears? You must remove the offender from among you. Even though I'm physically far away from you, my spirit is present with you, and as one who is present with you, I have already evaluated and judged the, per the perpetrator. Mm, Paul's cold. Paul's from the hood of Israel. <laughs> so, so watch this, y'all. So call a meeting, and when you gather together in the name of our Lord Jesus, and you know my spirit is pre present with you, in the infinite power of our Lord Jesus, watch this, release this man over to Satan. For the destruction of his rebellious flesh. Turn him over. In hope, why? That his spirit may be rescued and restored in the day of our Lord. What does that mean? If you have people in your life who say they're saved and, they, and there's no fruit, they're backslidden in discussion. So stop praying. Stop saying, well, I know they know the Lord. No, they don't. Well, but they may know, but they don't. They ain't afraid of it. And so now, you should pray, Lord, let whatever happens happen. Lord, they're yours. You can have, Lord, I've taken my prayers and go pray for what's mine. That's called wasted grace. We do that. When they didn't hear you, just pray, pray for something else. Pray for the flowers or for the present you raise or whatever. I mean, pray. Because they don't hear that anymore. They've become a law or a God to themselves. They do not fear God. And so with that in mind, you say, Lord, they're yours. Satan, have your way. And I think if we pray that more often, our people who are not saved turn will turn quicker. Stop coddling carnality. Chapter 20. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Page 120. Mark out a straight path for your feet and work at a lit, work and work at living the holy life. Hebrews 12, 13 and 14. All right. Holiness is not an end unto itself. Rather, it is a passageway into what's most important. Let's now turn to the irresistible aspect of it by examining our opening scripture from a different translation. Pursue holiness, which no one will no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12:14. The word pursue is the Greek word diako, which is defined as to something with intense effort and with definite purpose or goal. In looking at both translations and hearing diako is defined, the, the definition, there is no question this statement speaks of passionately chasing at the holiness with the intent of apprehending it. So, with that in mind, I have a question for you all. What does your pursuit of holiness look like? What is your individual pursuit of holiness look like? Just think for a second. Because, because we all should have one. If you're not pursuing God, what are you, what are you pursuing? You know, as we, as we were on that boat with 3,000 people, the engines never stopped until it was in port. If he stopped the engines while we were out at sea, we would be at the mercy of the sea. And if you're not pursuing God, you're stagnant, you're stale, you, you can't hear from God, you have no vision. The Bible says without a vision, the people, the people perish or they cast off restraint. So answer that question for me. What does your individual pursuit of holiness look like? And can you describe your daily efforts and processes and procedures to do that? Well, gee, Pastor, I mean, that's kind of technical. Yeah, it is. You know why? Because when you want to go have an affair or cuss somebody out, 
or have road rage, or if you want to, to do something just stupid, you got to have a pre-process before you, so you can process. You got to think about it before you do it. You got okay. What if this happens? What if this happens? So let's go to page one twenty-two now, at the bottom of the second paragraph. I'm oh, no, Yes, hold on. One twenty-two. All right. So it says this was well, actually almost to the bottom of the uh, last paragraph. It says, if we lack godly fear, we lack the drive to pursue the holy behavior, granting us the privilege of His manifest presence. Hmm. Jesus says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, I will love him and manifest myself to him. It's worthy, it's worth repeating, no behavior holiness, no seeing the Lord. Why is this so critical? First, if we don't see him, if we lack his manifest presence, we can't know him intimately. We can only know about him, not Unlike my relationship with the United States presidents, or worse, we, we are deceived. So now, let's get down here to the second reason is equally important. Without the holding him, not being in his presence, we can't be changed or transformed into his likeness. Paul mentions that those who see the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. 2 Corinthians 3.18 this transformation begins within the subsequently begins in, but then subsequently works out where it is witnessed by others. And that's the key, y'all. And I was talking to Shauna this week about our Christmas plan and yada 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 and and you know it's, it's salt and light. And I was like, we have got to make a difference as Christians. And y'all, there's nothing wrong with blending in to overtake. Y'all okay, y'all missed that didn't you? There's nothing wrong with blending in to the world to overtake the world. Jesus did it all the time. He blended in. Now, he said, yes, I came to give a sword. But by the same token, too, he crushed paradigms. He crushed thought process. He, he crushed religion and made it out of relationship. So our challenge as Christians is, you know, wherever you go, whether you're a school teacher, mechanic, um, postman, uh, secretary, nurse, doctor, blend in to overtake. Have a, have a plan. We, we, you know what? I know I'm just, I'm just this, I'm just that. But you know what? Joseph came in as a prisoner. And he quickly, in 15 years, became the second most important person in, in Israel. And you've got to understand that you're there for a purpose. And the purpose may not be your own purpose, but it's God's purpose. Oh, there's so much fun. All right, we're almost done here. Let's see here. Our purity cannot be like the Pharisees, Jesus said. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Their motives were as impure and filthy as dead corpse. Watch this, y'all. They lack the fear of the Lord, which in turn caused them to pursue a righteousness that was strictly based on outward behavior, making their projected image the focus. Wow. This prevented the inner transformation that brings forth corresponding our behavior. They believe they knew God, but the reality is they didn't know the creator who stood before them and consequently were out of step with his wishes. They fooled themselves. Even so today, the holiness we pursue must originate from our hearts. And that's important too, gang, because watch this. By me talking here, please don't go and pursue God. I'm just giving you a, a blueprint, a format, a game plan. You have to want it. You have to say, you know what? Yeah, I need to pursue God. Because you know what? Every negative thing, hear me, every negative thing that you deal with on a regular basis will be taken care of when you pursue God. You know why? The Bible says that if you keep your mind stayed on him, he'll keep you in perfect peace. 
The Bible says, Matthew 6 or 3, seek first, 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 the kingdom of God. And then all these things that you want, they'll be added to you. But we get so distracted, disillusioned, and then we go into denial about who God is in our lives. And we cannot do that, church. It's easy to do it. The world says, believe in yourself. I have no confidence in Jerry Campus at all. Paul says, have no confidence in the flesh. I am a useless, pathetic human being without Jesus. But with him, I'm a bad brother. <laughs> I can do anything. I can do whatever I want to do. Anything that, that, that I'm called to do. And so can you, church. So can you. Amen. So can you. Amen. All right, here we go. Let's, let's finish up here. Hallelujah. Oh, wow. We're almost done. Okay, cool. Now watch this. This is so cool. Even so today, the whole issue we pursue, okay, there it is, all right. Uh, last paragraph of 123, it's not enough to have an outward form of godliness, but deny the power of transformation of our inward desires. We must long for truth in our inward parts, motives, and, and, and intentions. That must be our pursuit. The Apostle James is very strong with believers who take holiness lightly. He writes, your motives are all wrong. You want only what you'll give, give what will give you pleasure. You adulterers, you don't realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy. Now, I'll say this in closing. <laughs> when I got married 24 years ago, I made a vow to my wife that she'd be my only. And the thing that keeps me from having an affair other than, you know, death by a black woman <laughs> and two black children, <laughs> is that I am truly in love with God. Amen. Amen. Hear what I'm saying? I put God, because see, I had God before Tony. I have my walk with him before he walked me towards her. And so the fact is that I'm afraid of him more than her. I'm afraid of my witness to my children. I'm afraid of my witness to you all. I'm afraid of, I'm afraid of my witness to the angels in heaven that are overlooking it. The Bible says that we have a cloud of witnesses looking at us. What would my mother say when I got there? If I got there after doing that? Her mother. My dad. And so what keeps my head right? is that I'm so committed to pursue holiness. Someone said something about 20 years ago, and I didn't get it until, I, until a few years ago. He said, nothing beats holy living. Nothing. Nothing, y'all. Nothing. I don't care what you do. Nothing beats being on fire for God. Nothing. It is, it is y'all, I have so much peace, and I told my wife, I love being boring. <laughs> I love it. I love being boring and liking things quiet, and just, just I love because... It's just so nice. And I challenge you all, as you, as you grow more like Christ Jesus, and it says here, it's no different from Jesus. The reason I passionately avoid committing adultery against Jesus is that I don't want to lose the intimacy with it that, that, that we share. That's the thing, too, is that if I have an affair, what's up with my intimacy with Jesus? Don't tell me you love God and you're cheating. I don't hear that. I don't hear that. I don't hear that. I don't hear that. I don't I love the closeness of his presence and the intimate conversations we have together. I love it when he shares secrets with me that I've never known before. That could, that could be why we're told the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he will show them his covenant. We are now just beginning to discover the irresistible aspect of holiness. We'll continue unveiling its beauty in the next chapter. One thing I can tell you about being a Christian is that it's irresistible. It's irresistible. It is so, and I don't, and I don't want to use the word addictive, but it's, it's life-consuming. Because it is what I think about when I wake up and when, when I go to sleep. And again, I'm not bragging because it took me a while to be there because I mean, this I was on my mind, but at this point in my life, and you know, it can be if you're 20 or, or 90, 
Are you pursuing him? What does your pursuit look like right now? That's what we need to do today. What does your pursuit of holiness look like? Is it what your mother taught you? Your daddy taught you? Is it what you learned on, on, on podcasts, on YouTube? It's your pursuit. It should be individually yours. God made me different than Joe or Paul or Adam or, or Shahid or, or Dustin or, or my son. He made us all unique. And in our pursuit, it should parallel in the passion, but be different in the directives. That's good. Write that down, somebody. That's good. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but it's so good because... Me and Adam and Dustin and, and Joe and, and Tom, we're all pursuing God as, as men of God. But mine will look different than Phil's or Jason's or Adam's or David. It'll look different. And so this week, you need to figure out what your pursuit is, how it looks. How are you pursuing God daily? Is, is it through a devotion? Is it through accountability? Is it through spend time in the word? Only you know. And, and if you aren't pursuing God, then you got to wonder, do you really, is it irresistible? Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Father God, that we get to pursue God. Not that you're running from us, but we're running to you. We, we want to become more and more like you, Lord Jesus. We want to become more and more like you because you are irresistible. We thank you, Father God, that as we grow in your presence, we're going to grow in peace. We're going to grow in blessing and favor. We're going to grow in the things of you, God. We're going to think like you. We're going to um, act like you. We're going to pray like you, Lord Jesus. We're going to have a passion like you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. And just quickly here, not the, but before we leave, if there's anyone here, just like I said earlier, what category are you in in, in in mankind towards God? Are you an on fire Christian? Do you live for Jesus? Is he, is he, is he everything in you? Do you think about him? Do you want to be more like him? Are you pursuing him day in, day out? That's a good thing. It's a good thing. That's called a relationship. I'm pursuing my wife. I'm, I, I live to make her happy. It's easy, of course, but I, I, I find ways to do things for her because I want her smiling all the time. I told her, my main thing is, honey, as, as long as you're my wife, your life will be pink and cotton. That's all I want, pink and cotton, pink and cotton. Or are you the kind of Christian that is a Christian, but slash backslidden? Don't ever be embarrassed about your position with Christ but the key is be embarrassed when you don't want to change the negative position that you are in Christ. Don't be ashamed of being, you know what? My life is a hot mess right now. My mind is off of God. It's on myself. It's on my bills. It's on these kids. It's on my ex. It's on this. And I'm struggling, PJ. I'm struggling. I'm going to hurt somebody right now. That's when you say, Lord, just like I said on the, in the worship, Everything, everything, I give it to you. Or are you on the far end spectrum? You'll say, I've never asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I've never repented of my sins. And that means that when you say that, you're making a conscious decision to say, Lord, you are bigger than me. You are God. You are creator. You created me. And I will serve you, and I will leave everything and person behind. Not that you leave your house. Well, if you shack them, yes, you do. Or, or within a certain amount of time. Days. But you only you know where you are. But if you are unsaved, if you're backslidden, I want, I want you to sit right where you are, but I want you to raise your hand, and I'm going to extend my hand, and I'm going to pray with you real quick. So if you're unsaved, raise your hand. And if you're backslidden, raise your hand. Awesome. All right. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for these men and women who are being transparent, 
who are being honest, Lord. I see your hands. Thank you, Father God, right now that you see their hands and their hands are a representation of their hearts. They want to change. They want to be like you, Father. So, Lord, right now, I thank you, Lord, that you will give them tools, tactics, techniques, Lord, through your spirit, through this church, through relationship, God, to become more and more like you. Those who raise your hands, I want you to repeat after me. You can say it softly, but it's important to say something. So I just want you to, you know, let's everyone say this, and then we'll be all together. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. I repent of my sins. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. And I submit my life to you. Now and forever. From this point on, I will live my life for you and not for myself. Today, my pursuit begins. Today, I pursue holiness. So right now, Lord, my life is yours from this point on. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, if you raise your hand, what you have to do now is get something in your hand, in your head. So what I want you to do is, after church, if you raise your hand, there's some pamphlets up here, and it says, now what? That will guide you through the process. Joe, can you stand, please? Um, that's amazing here today. Um, Sean, can you stand? And I think Bridget and Sean, can y'all stand real quick? And Miss Nancy and Mary. Just real quick. And Katie, please. And Randy. All right. If you raise your hand sometime today or tomorrow, get all these people. Okay? I, I'm, and, and, I, and I made a promise that I wouldn't, you know, embarrass anybody. But, but now you raise your hand. And now you owe God this. Not me, God. And yourself. These people are people I trust. And no, not that people didn't raise stand on trust, but I mean, these people have position in the church of, of, of either prayer team or minister or pastor. Where's this Margaret? This Margaret, she's back there too. Okay, hurry, her also. But go find these people. Ask them how to grow in Christ. Ask them, what can we do? What can I do to grow in Christ and be a stronger man or one of God? They will walk you through the process. They're trained, they're spirit-filled, and they will take care of you. But you cannot do this alone. You cannot have a YouTube pastor. You can have a podcast pastor. You've got to find someone to be accountable to and be in church on a regular basis. And then God will change your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So it's up to you then. All right. I love you all. Have the Cowboys lost yet? Okay, good. Deal. All right. Here we go. Love y'all. I'll see y'all next week. Be blessed. Amen. Not much faith there. No, no. Thank you. You just sound like her now. You are the most oh unbelieving God. fan I've ever seen. I, I talk about it all the time. Like, you are unbelievable for the Cowboys. Yes, sir. Not that I have.